The next session uh, is the Deontological Pursuit of Truth, the Slippery Slope of Forbidden Knowledge. Dr. Gad Saad, uh, who is a professor of marketing uh, at uh, Concordia University, and also the former hol holder of the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption, is here to talk to us. He is, in addition to being a, uh, an academic, he is a blogger, a YouTuber, and a prolific author. His book, uh, the let me get the full title, the, the Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense, was released in October 2020, and it is an international bestseller with 17 signed translation rights so far. His next book has a great title, The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life, and that will be released in July 2023. So please take the stage. Thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, I'm happy to be here as part of the 10-year anniversary of Caesar. Uh, it's interesting that we said Caesar because in the, in the book on happiness that's forthcoming, I delve into the ancient Greeks, so I got to know the works of Marcus Aurelius and, and other types of Caesars, but happy anniversary to this Caesar. So, uh, is it this one? So first, a few terms for some of you who may not know the, the distinction between these two ethical systems. So the title of the talk is The Deontological Pursuit of Truth. So what does deontological mean and how does it contrast to consequentialism? So deontological statement is one that is an absolute truth, right? So if I say it is never okay to lie, that would be an example of a deontological statement. If my lovely wife who's sitting there uh, were to say, do I look fat in those jeans, then I would quickly put on my consequentialist hat and I would say, I would rather spare her feelings, although she never looks fat in any jeans. <laughs> She's always splendid. The, the, the top line on my CV is that I convinced her to marry me. The rest is just fluff. Uh, so for most things in life we are consequentialist, but there are some pursuits that by their very nature, the ethos has to be one that is deontological. And so freedom of speech is a deontological principle. There is no I believe in freedom of speech, but, and I'll talk a bit about some of those buts in a second. Freedom of inquiry is a deontological principle. The pursuit of truth is a deontological principle. Here are some examples of actual positions taken by some super progressive, highfalutin, smart colleagues of mine, or as we say in French, les bien pensants, the good thinkers, right? Or as Thomas Sowell would say, the anointed ones, right? So these are examples of faulty consequentialists. So freedom of speech is great, but it is perfectly reasonable to have banned Donald Trump from Twitter because he is simply too dangerous to be allowed to spew his garbage. I don't have a dog in this fight, I'm Canadian, so I can say this without being accused of being a right-wing, uh, you know, uh, insurrectionist. Number two, presumption of innocence, which should be the ontological principle, that's great, but not for the serial gang rapist Brett Kavanaugh. Holding a seat on the Supreme Court is simply too important a job to take chances with this guy. Here's another one. These are all statements that I've heard from some of our top intellectuals. An impartial press is great. Of course, I, I believe in an impartial press. But to have allowed the Hunter Biden story to be reported would have led to Trump's re-election. Hence, it was perfectly fair to suppress it. And then finally, perhaps most directly relevant to today's uh, event, freedom of inquiry is great but not if it is antithetical to the ethos of social justice. And I, of course, argue that no, the pursuit of truth has to be deontological. And this is exactly what this says, feelings trump facts. We condemn freedom of speech if it hurts the feelings of, of others. That's exactly what a consequentialist ethos is. Let me contextualize these two ethical systems with something that happened in 1960. 
uh, and I, I might need to apologize to one or two people who were at my talk at Stanford earlier uh, this past fall. There are a few slides that are the same, but hopefully there's enough new material for you to enjoy. So Adolf Eichmann was by definition one of the most execrable people that you could hope to ever encounter. He was one of the architects of the final solution. By the way, for those of you who don't know, um, we are Lebanese Jews who escaped execution in the Middle East. So few people are as vested in their Jewish identity as I am. You'll see in a second why that's relevant. The Mossad had a program where they were hunting down Nazis and they finally tracked Adolf Eichmann to South America. And now they faced one of two possible positions. They could very quickly put a bullet in his head and return without anybody knowing who did what. Or they could stick to deontological ethics and say at great personal cost to the Mossad agents or personal risk, and at great potential diplomatic risk, he deserves his day in court. And so they ended up ushering him out of, I believe it was Argentina, back to Israel where he was tried and found guilty. That is a perfect example of a deontological ethic because even someone as bad as Adolf Eichmann, which one might argue is slightly more reprehensible than Donald Trump, although many of my colleagues would not make the distinction between the two, uh, we stick to deontological principles. That's what separates the great tradition of the West from other traditions. And I come from one of those other traditions called the Middle East, and it's typically incumbent on people who have sampled at the buffet of other cultures to warn Westerners that don't take for granted what you have here because history is not replete with Western values. So be careful and be judicious in defending the ontological principles. Of course, this idea, the noble lie from Plato's Republic is, you know, at times it's okay to lie for a greater good. And we saw this, of course, and we see this in academia where you do have an institutionalization of forbidden knowledge. Don't do this research because it might marginalize some group, right? So there are downstream negative consequences of you doing this research, so please hold off doing it. Or, this is the epistemology of social justice, if the results of your research support the politically correct na narrative, then you're hailed as a hero. But if it doesn't, then clearly you are Adolf Eichmann. Of course, infectious diseases, we saw this where it turns out that if 100,000 people get together for a BLM uh, protest, the virus doesn't spread because the virus recognizes your progressive politics and you become inoculated against that. And then, of course, in preventive medicine, rather than telling the truth, obesity is not a good thing. I used to be much heavier and I lost a lot of weight and went back to being my svelte self. Well, a lot of people say that that's, it marginalizes the over, overweight folks. You have to be body positive, and it's not true that uh, there are any medical, there's any medical evidence suggesting that being overweight is bad for you. So here again, you are telling a lie because you think that it is otherwise helpful to people not to be marginalized about being gravitationally challenged. So let's go back to forbidden knowledge. Uh, and as Ari said, yes, here is the image of Socrates. But of course, we've got Galileo, the other famous case, where the church said, hey, this is not good stuff that you're espousing. We don't like it. And if any of you have seen the movie Name of the Rose, the entire premise of Name of the Rose which I highly recommend you either read the book or if you don't want to read the book, see the movie. I think it was in the mid-80s. The idea behind the book is that the, uh, this group of monks, anointed monks, have decided that to read some of Aristotle's work, especially as relating to humor and comedy, would, would be you know, the devil's work. And therefore what they did is they laced the pages of Aristotle's book with a poison so that if any monk went into the forbidden library and started flipping the pages, they would end up dying. That's what forbidden knowledge is. 
and I see it endlessly in academia. I've, I always tell people that uh, I faced two great wars in my life. The first great war was growing up in the Lebanese Civil War. The second great war is being now almost a professor for 30 years, seeing the war on reason, on logic, on science, but always cloaked in the robe of consequentialist ethics. Some more recent forms of forbidden knowledge. Here's Lysenko to my left. Lysenko, uh, Lysenkoism led to the death of millions of people uh, from famine because he argued that the fundamental laws of genetics and heredity were incorrect precisely because they didn't adhere to the Marxist uh, philosophy. But more recently, Elena Chan and Matt Ridley and I think this was briefly mentioned in the previous uh, speaker's uh, conversation. They, uh, Matt Ridley, by the way, is someone who's been on my show. He's an evolutionary biologist. He, he was in the House of Lords. Elish, Elina Shan is also someone who's, you know, has the right credentials. And when they came out with the book, with their book a, a while ago, suggesting that there was quite a lot of convincing evidence for the lab leak theory, uh, it was very, very hard for them to find platforms. As a matter of fact, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I should say I'm ashamed because many of you who know my work know that I don't back down uh, in, on many occasions from anything. But when they reached out to me to come on my show, I put on a consequentialist hat, maybe regrettably, and I said, I'm happy to hold the conversation with you, but I can assure you that YouTube will shut down the conversation and probably my channel will disappear. And so while I'm all for the deontological pursuit of truth, there is a pragmatic reality here, which is we're going to waste our time doing the show, and you're, it's never going to see the light of day. Is this the right way to adjudicate the decisions? Probably not. But of course, the bien pensant knew better than the great unwashed. I have faced this kind of stuff for even before I got into the culture wars. Uh, as I have for many years now. Originally, in my scientific work, I faced this because some of you may know that I uh, pioneered the use of evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology in studying consumer behavior and psychology of decision making. And for most social scientists, even today, the idea of arguing that the human mind has evolved through the dual process of natural and sexual selection remains a very controversial issue. And so I could share with you endless uh, desk rejection notes that I've received from, from people that really would be laughable. It would be difficult to understand that this was not satirical. But the idea is that you know evolutionary theory is quack stuff. Evolutionary psychology is pseudo quack Nazi business. Well, congratulations. You have a Jewish Nazi, apparently, who's doing evolutionary psychology. But that's the kind of forbidden knowledge. Why are you studying this nonsense? What makes us human is that we transcend our biology. We're cultural animals, according to the social scientists. And as a matter of fact, most departments or most fields in the social sciences have defined themselves as typically rejecting biology. So you could study anthropology and economics and sociology and psychology and consumer behavior and all the rest of it without ever mentioning or hearing the word biology. How is that possible? How could it be that every single other species on Earth, if I were a student of that species, I would have to incorporate its phylogenetic history, its evolutionary trajectory. But there's only one species that is apparently outside the realm of biology. They're called humans. They're called consumers. They're called decision makers. No, they're not. We're just as prone to our biology as any other species. Here's my favorite quote by a scientist because it perfectly would capture, if I ever had the, the temerity of writing an autobiography of my life, I would just have to have one page consisting of only that quote because it perfectly captures my academic career. And this is the contra to forbidden knowledge. So this is what J.B.S. Haldane said. He was a very famous evolutionary geneticist. He said that when scientists are exposed to a new idea, they go through four cognitive stages of of accepting the idea, the first three of which they rejected. So, the f so I suppose the process of acceptance will pass through the usual four stages. One, 
this is worthless nonsense. Once the evidence starts coming in, well, this is an interesting but perverse point of view. More evidence comes in. Well, this is true, but quite unimportant. Who cares about studying biology, the biology of consumers? There's no practical applications professors had. And then when the evidentiary threshold is reached and the tsunami of evidence drowns you, oh, I always said so. I was always a fan of your work. Now, the, the, the good news for me, and maybe bad news for some of the detractors, is that I am an email hoarder. And so I've, I've retained emails going back 25 years that actually has the same person traversing through all those stages, where I was a complete abject imbecile at stage one, but then at stage four, we would be honored to have you give the, how, how did I go from imbecile to we would be honored? Well, it's because we don't uh, codify forbidden knowledge in science. We allow all ideas to be passed through the evolutionary epistemology of debating which is a good idea and which is bad and let the best idea win. So you might imagine that some of the things that the former speaker mentioned, I might staunchly disagree with. To that point, some new tricks to stifle academic freedom, there's always new strategies. The, the, the fascist virant, variant changes. So now it's under the cloak of it's hate speech. It's hurtful speech. Not quite as bad as hate speech, but it's hurtful. It's not inclusive. If you do research showing, showing a particular sex difference, it might marginalize, it might perpetuate the sexist status quo, the patriarchal sexist status quo. It's misinformation or it's willful disinformation. So let me ask you this. If I say that men too can menstruate, is that veridical or is that disinformation? If I say that all sex differences are due to social construction, is that veridical or is that misinformation or disinformation? I could give you 6,000 other examples where you wouldn't be able to tell me whether it should assort on misinformation, disinformation, or whether it's veridical. So there is no forbidden knowledge. There's only the deontological pursuit of truth. Let me give you some examples from my own life. Here I am in 2017 with the head neo-Nazi of Canada, Jordan Peterson. We were both supposed to be speaking at an event at Ryerson, Univ Ryerson University. Ryerson now has changed its name because they found that Ryerson somehow had some you know, nefarious past, and I think it's now called Toronto Metropolitan University. I, I can't remember the exact change, but we were speaking at an event called the stifling of free speech on university campus. What do you think happened to that event? Stifled. There were, there were signs throughout Toronto, I mean, physical signs and also Facebook pages, don't allow neo-Nazi white supremacists in our city. I'm Lebanese Jewish. I'm a white supremacist, neo-Nazi. There it is, there's, there's the, the exact thing, no fascists in our city. Here I am speaking in 2017 in front of the Canadian Senate about Bill C-16. Bill C-16 was at the time a bill that hadn't passed seeking to incorporate gender identity and gender expression under the rubric of hate speech. And as I tried to explain to the senators, I've, I'm about as socially liberal as they come. So of course, I am a fervent supporter that all people should live free of uh, bigotry and, and so on. But in the pursuit of that noble objective, we don't murder truth and we don't rape truth in, that, in, the, per, in, the, in the pursuit of that objective. So I can both walk and chew gum at the same time. I could be a fervent supporter of transgender rights, which should be no different than anybody else's rights. You shouldn't be targeted for your personhood. But I can also say, mm, yeah, I don't think men too can menstruate. That's a wrong statement. But maybe the previous speaker would say, I am spreading disinformation, who knows. 
Here are some other examples that speak to uh, an ethos of anti-enlightenment. The, the one from the National Post, this is a, a, an example from Quebec. So the Quebec deputy minister uh, had to apologize and walk back some comments he had made because in Canada we have the uh, program of indigenizing the university. And indigenizing the university could mean many things. It could mean that prior to any formal gathering, we recognize that you know we're sitting on stolen land and so on, which again might be gauche to say at a graduating ceremony where this is the opportunity to place the spotlight on the students who've just finished their degrees. They shouldn't be encumbered with past historical grievances, but yet that ceremony starts with saying you've raped the land you're sitting on stolen land self-flagellation but that's okay we can we can discuss whether that's an appropriate thing to do or not but how about indigenizing the actual knowledge base that we teach so now there is a push so that all professors should seek to incorporate indigenous knowledge in their courses well i studied mathematics and i I can assure you that the distribution of prime numbers exists outside of my personal identity markers. That's what defines mathematics. But yet here, this minister was you know, really chastised because he argued, what do you mean we have to judge the environmental impact of certain policies not by the scientific method, but by other ways of knowing? And that, that of course, led to what you see on the other image. This was at the University of Cape Town, I think. Uh, they're called fallists, right? Uh, science must fall. Science is only one of several ways of knowing. No, there, no, it isn't. There isn't. There's only one epistemology that can get us to the moon. There's only one epistemology that allows us to map the human genome. Now, that doesn't mean that, for example, indigenous people who've lived in certain uh, ecosystems don't have accumulated knowledge about the flora and fauna of that ecosystem. But if we're adjudicating scientific issues, there is no indigenous epistemology, just like there isn't any Lebanese Jewish epistemology. There's just the scientific method. Speaking of, I was mentioning mathematics, uh, you know, the Cassandra's curse, uh, you know, being prophetic and one of the regrettable maybe things that I have as a talent is that I identify some satirical situation and then I fold my hands and wait for reality to catch up to my satire. Here is one from a few years ago. I donned my social justice warrior uh, wig and I announced satirically that I had just coined, founded a new field called social justice mathematics. And pers the reason why I use my satire on mathematics is precisely by definition that is the discipline that would be completely impervious to those issues. I mean, literally by axiomatic definition. And so I did things like, you know, we should get rid of irrational numbers because it marginalizes mental illness. The inequality operator creates an, I just went on and on. And by the way, I receive emails from mathematicians who say that they use these uh, in their faculty lounges to, and they crack up, they can't believe that this reality is happening. Well, guess what? Now there are academic papers that have been published demonstrating that mathematics is a form of white colonialist imperial science. Is that the kind of world we want to live in? So let me just quickly segue to, so this in the, uh, the Parasitic Mind was my last book. In the book, I basically argue that in the same way that uh, all sorts of animals, including human beings, could be parasitized by actual brain worms. Well, humans can be parasitized by another class of brain worms. I call them idea pathogens. These idea pathogens are literally parasitic because to your detriment, they end up leading you slowly to the abyss of infinite lunacy. And you'll see in a second, I'm going to link it to the ontological pursuits and so on. So there's a whole bunch of these, but let me mention one. Postmodernism is arguably, in my view, 
the granddaddy of all idea pathogens because it, it rejects the possibility that there's even an epistemology of truth. There are no objective truths other than the one truth that there are no objective truths. And everything is shackled by subjectivity. Everything is shackled by personal biases. So we can't even agree on what someone's biological sex is because it's up for debate. And I've mentioned this before, but it's worth maybe mentioning to this audience. I still have a bit of time, I think 20 minutes. Uh, I once hosted, I had a doctoral student who just defended his dissertation and uh, we were going out to dinner uh, myself, my wife, the kids weren't born yet. This is in 2002, so this is quite a while ago, 21 years ago. So myself, my wife, my doctoral student, and he was bringing a date along. Uh, and so he called me before going out that evening to warn me that the, the lady that he was bringing along was a graduate student in cultural anthropology, women's studies, and postmodernism, to which I answered, ah, the holy trinity of bullshit. Uh, and of course, the answer was the, the reason why he had called me is, you know, let's have a good time. Let's not uh, sit. And I said, oh, this is your night. Mum's the word. I'm going to be on my best behavior, which of course was a lie. Uh, and so, about halfway through the evening, I turned to the lady very politely, very, I think, graciously, and I said, you're a postmodernist, yes? Yes. Can I maybe hit you with some examples that I think are, might be universals and you can tell me? how I'm a simpleton. She said, sure, go for it. I said, is it not true that for homo sapiens only women bear children? She scoffed that I could be such an idiot and said, absolutely not. I said, it's not true that only women bear children in sexually dimorphic species with two phenotypes. She said, no. I said, how? She said, well, there is a Japanese tribe where off some Japanese island within their folkloric and mythological realm, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting to the material biological realm, that's how you keep women you know, preg barefoot and pregnant. Once I recovered from the mini stroke uh, at having faced her that kind of discourse, I said, well, maybe I can propose a slightly less contentious example. Is it not true that since time immemorial, sailors have relied on the premise that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? Is that not true? And there she used something from a variant of postmodernism. This is Jacques Derrida. It's deconstructionism. Language creates reality. She said, what do you mean by East and West? And what do you mean by the sun? That which you call the sun, I might call dancing hyena, literally her words. I said, well, fine, the dancing hyena rises in the East and sets in the West. And she said, I don't play those label games. So this was not an escapee from a mental institution, although the, the distinction can't be clear. This was a graduate student, maybe getting levied fees of $80,000 to go to a prestigious university like USC. That's a Darwinian cul-de-sac. What's the point of studying that? Can you build better bridges with postmodernism? Can you understand oncology better? Can you understand pure mathematics better? No, it's pure nihilism. It's pure intellectual terrorism. I won't go through all of these, but what I argue basically is that each of these parasitic ideas are rooted in an ethos of consequentialism. And again, the pursuit of truth has to be deontological. That's what makes the West the great intellectual tradition that it has. So I won't go through it just to, to, not, bo to not bore you, but maybe I'll mention one. So take, for example, social constructivism. Social constructivism is the idea that we are born tabula rasa, with equal potentiality, and it's only the vagaries of our unique life trajectories, whether mom hugged me enough or mom didn't hug me enough, that I become the next Lionel Messi. If only she had hugged me right and gave me the right schedule of reinforcement of burgers, then I could have been the next Lionel Messi. Well, that's a very hopeful message that every parent would love to hear, because I would love to know that all my children have an equal probability of being the next Einstein, the next Michael Jordan, or the next Lionel Messi. So consequentialist ethos would be, that's great, it makes us all feel good, but it's perfectly rooted in nonsense. We're not all born with equal biological potentiality. We're all equal under the law, we could all support that,
But to argue that we are all born with equal potentiality is pure nonsense. But there was a whole field in psychology and behaviorism that was rooted in that ethos. Okay? So again, each of these parasitic ideas are wonderful in that they elevate our feelings to the detriment of the truth. No, the truth should be deontological. I'm not going to go through all here. I just want to mention very briefly that one of the uh, regrettable realities of having forbidden knowledge is you end up creating echo chambers. Here is some data of the Democrat to Republican ratios across different disciplines. And I won't go through all of them, but disciplines where people celebrate that they are quite even-handed, let's say in economics, might be five to one or seven to one. Now that's extraordinarily lopsided, but those are examples of less biased fields. As you go to more the, towards the activist field, you get ratios of 130 to zero. In other words, you're just as likely to you know, run across a unicorn as you are to run across a Republican sociologist. Now, some of you in this room might say, but oh, that's great. Republicans are idiots and, and professors are smart. Therefore, of course, they should be liberal. Well, no. On some issues that are incontro incontrovertibly true, uh, we can agree that politics has no bearing. But on issues like, is the death penalty moral or not? What should be the optimal fiscal policy? What should be the immigration policy? There are very valid arguments on both sides of the aisle. And so any reasonable person would say, well, you know, I, I really, I think, would benefit from hearing what the other side would have to say. And certainly if I'm a student paying $80,000, but that's not what we offer our students. And by doing so, we are literally epistemologically cheating them. Just to give a few more examples, I, I thought I would have less time, but so let me maybe spend a bit more time. So to show you what happens when you are driven by an ethos of political correctness or a consequentialist ethos, since 9-11 alone, there have been now, I think the number is at 36,000 terror attacks in nearly 70 countries by one particular group. Okay? The perpetrators of those 36, 37,000 terror attacks tell you exactly why they did it. And they tell you that it's motivated by their religious fervor, and they'll quote you specific package, uh, passages. On the right-hand side of this clip, I just called for you some professorial reasons why it turns out that the perpetrators were lying about why they say they did it, because they know better, because forbidden knowledge, you shouldn't say certain things. Shh. It's due to lone wolfism. It's due to man-made disasters. That's a nice euphemism. It's due to violent video games. Who amongst us didn't play a violent video game and then join ISIS and Raqqa to throw off some gays from the rooftops? That's just a straight causal link. It's lack of adequate exposure to art. This is not satirical. These are real journalists, real professors who argue that lack of exposure to Dali and Chagall, and hence you haven't been aesthetically enriched, could lead to extremism. Why do they do that? Is it because they're that dumb? No, because there is some real information that you should not share. It's inappropriate, it's gauche, it will marginalize people. No, the deontological pursuit of truth has to be deontological. I won't go through the rest of them, but you get it. For example, beard bullying. Well, speaking of climate change, since our previous speaker spoke about climate change, Bill Nye, the science guy, explained to us, you know, in very simple language so we don't get too confused, he explained to us that what happened in the Bataclan Paris terror attack was very clearly causally linked to climate change. And, he, and you can go to the parasitic mind and you can have the full transcript. So the Syrian war, Syri Syrian civil war, and the subsequent terrorists who mowed down hundreds of people in Paris, you know, it was due to CO2 emissions and solar panels. 
a few quotes. Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. That's your third U.S. president, Thomas Jefferson. And speaking of consequentialism versus deontological, a harmful truth is better than a useful lie. That should be codified within the epistemology of every academic. There is nothing worse than not telling the truth if you're an academic, irrespective of what the downstream effects are. The George Orwell, you already know some of these quotes. Boy, was he prophetic. So how do we save our universities? How do we instill an ethos of the enlightenment? Well, here are some, uh, I need to wear my glasses because I can't see them. So number one, pursue knowledge unencumbered by ideological activism. No knowledge is forbidden if gathered objectively using the scientific method. Number two, no more identity politics. Instead, promote the dignity of the individual rather than supporting oppression Olympics and victimology poker. Speaking of which, I have willfully stopped applying for grants because I thought that it would be a deontological violation for me to go through the uh, charade of having to write a die statement, diversity, inclusion, and equity statement about how I'm going to diversify the methodology I use and the data analyses. I, I thought that data analytics were independent of my personal identity, but apparently not. Uh, is that a good thing for science? I don't know if I'm doing important science or not, but is it a good thing that I've taken myself out of these rounds of grant applications because I don't want to engage in the charade? No more, number three, no, oops, sorry. No more coddling of the culture of offense and the ethos of perfect, perpetual victimhood. No microaggressions, no trigger warnings, no safe spaces, no culture appropriation, the rest of the nonsense. One of the reasons why apparently it's hard to cancel me is because I have, I won the hand in victimology poker. I hold the highest hand. I'm a war refugee who escaped execution in Lebanon. So no story that you're going to come up with because you were misgendered at Wellesley College is going to trump my victimology story, right? Vic victimhood is, is not something to take lightly. I, I don't revel in the fact that my parents were kidnapped by Fatah and, and tortured. We escaped literal execution many times. I could tell you stories that you would have a hard time believing. But I overcame that victimology. I'm standing here before you at USC. That doesn't mean that I don't internalize my tragic past, but I've overcome it. I don't wallow in it all day long to get extra bonus points. That's what makes me who I am. Number four, a just society is rooted in the ethos of a meritocracy. We are not social ants. Why did I say that? E.O. Wilson, who recently passed away, he's the eminent Harvard entomologist, had a great quote, which I always find ways to quote because it's so poignant. He studied social ants, and he said, regarding communism, socialism, he said, great idea, wrong species. If I am an ant, it's wonderful for us to all be equal because there's just a reproductive queen and then there's a whole bunch of indistinguishable other entities. Humans are not ants. Some of us are taller, shorter, harder working, less hard working, smarter, less smart. We're not all with equal potentiality. So confusing, as many of you should know by now, equality of opportunities with equality of outcomes is a grotesque, cancerous, parasitic idea. Number five, promote an ethos of intellectual and political diversity as I pointed to earlier. Number six, all ideas, beliefs, and ideologies are open to criticism, debate, mocking, ridicule, and other forms of scrutiny short of direct incitement to violence or you know, libel and defamation and so on eradicate hate speech laws, university speech codes, codes regarding hostile environments, and the rest of it. And let me uh, walk the walk. I've told you that I'm Jewish and with my past history. Let's go back to the Nazis. There's nothing more offensive by definition than when Holocaust deniers deny the Holocaust. You'd be hard-pressed to find a greater source of 
misinformation and disinformation. Well, not misinformation, disinformation. Yet, as an absolutist free speech supporter, as one who believes in the deontology of free speech, I stand before you, the Jewish guy, with my personal history in the Middle East, and I tell you, I support the right of those imbeciles to spew their nonsense. We defeat their ideas by better ideas, not by protecting our fragile egos from hurtful language. Nothing is more offensive than the Holocaust denying, and I support their right to be that. And finally, science, reason, logic, and a commitment to evidence-based thinking, Trump, apologies if I use the, the word that triggers you, Trump, that Trump's ideology, hurt feelings, and fashionable anti-science for intellectual gibberish. Thank you very much.